minute ago, we had our lovely faces and titles up here, but our panel is about responsible design and innovation. And I think what we can do is just first introduce ourselves and then we'll just get into it. I think we've all been hearing some interesting things today that I kind of, uh, I kind of want to react to. And, uh, and yeah, towards the end of the discussion, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. So I'll, I'll start. I am Cheryl Kababa. I am an executive director at Artifact, which is a design consultancy in Seattle. And um, what we sort of specialize in is responsible design and human-centered design. And uh, last year, we developed a tool called the Tarot Cards of Tech. And it basically helps people in the technology practice to think about the unintended consequences of their work. Hi, uh, I'm Carrie Jenkins. I'm the CEO of Substantial. Substantial is a product consultancy in Seattle. And so we partner with startups and foundations and enterprises to create their digital businesses and products. Hello, I'm Stephen Teal. I'm at Accenture. I lead responsible innovation. It's an area that I got into about six and a half years ago while leading research for our, our uh, technology vision and then uh, ended up forming a group of about 22 people, mostly external, to look at a number of different issues in that space. We published a bunch of things in uh, 2016 at Accenture.com slash data ethics. And the reception from that was really kind of middle management layer. It was directors and managers of data science and engineering teams, um, which is not my exact audience that I'm looking for. And so um, there were a few investments that continued to happen, but most of it kind of tailed off. And then the, the grand gift of Cambridge Analytica came along. And all of a sudden, um, incomings were from general counsels, boards of directors, and senior executives, which gave me the, the kind of cover I needed to double down in that space. And since for about the last year and a half, that's been my full-time focus. And I now have a, a very small team as well. So that's good. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. I am Mia Dand. So I may not be on the original program. I was a last minute substitute. But I love, I'm happy to be here. Uh, because um, I left the technology world about five years back. And I've worked for all the big names that you can think of, uh, ranging from Symantec, eBay, back in the day, when it was the big kahuna, uh, until uh, Google some years back. So. Uh, I focus more on the responsible adoption of technology now uh, because I was disillusioned with the way technology was just being used to market things and sell more things Then the world doesn't need more stuff. The world needs a more uh, thoughtful approach to adoption of technology. So that's what I help companies do. I focus more on corp corporate uh, governance and compliance and uh, ethics of technology. And to us that I published the 100 women in AI ethics list that you may have heard of. Uh, that was last year. And since then, uh, it has uh, Salesforce did the first conference last year for this group. Uh, it's an amazing group of women. And uh, we also had a conference. Uh, Microsoft did another one in the Bay Area. But we did our official launch of uh, the list and the work that we are doing at Oxford on Monday which is why I'm a little jet lag. I just got back yesterday. It's exciting stuff. Uh, but what we're trying to do is bring, uh, it's not a pipeline issue. It's more of a recognition issue. We're trying to bring more visibility to, yeah, a lot of nodding hats. <laughs> it's women out there, they're overqualified and they do really uh, like amazing things. So we need to make sure that we are recognizing their contributions because when we talk about ethics, it's, I want to make sure everybody like takes is the one thing you take away from is when we talk about ethics of AI, any technology that excludes women or any minority group is intrinsically inherently unethical, right? So we shouldn't be talking about here's diversity, here's ethics. They're the same thing. They have to go hand in hand. So that's pretty much what I've been working on. We also launched an online directory, which is open to everyone if you want to become part of a community. Uh, but we will talk more about responsible innovation for right now. But I'm happy to share more information later. Great. So I think one thing that I'm recognizing is that are all of us consultants? Accenture, <laughs> right? Are you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, we are, Cheryl. So, <laughs> so I find that kind of interesting because um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna kick off with a doozy here, kind of recognizing this. So I've been reading 
Uh, I started reading Brad Smith's book. Um, he just wrote that book, Tools and Weapons, and he's the le uh, president at Microsoft. And one of the things that he said was, when you create tech that changes the world, you have to take responsibility to address the world you've created. Um, what I'm wondering, and anyone can pick this one up, is do you, do you think the change can actually happen from inside these huge companies? <laughs> Let's just go there. <laughs> Let's just go there. Um, maybe. Uh, I don't. I don't think it's going to happen just from within, though. I think we have to. I think we have to demand it, and I think people are. I, and when things happen like Cambridge Analytica, it gets a lot of attention, um, and conversations happen, and so that generates a lot of energy around it. It also generates a lot of cover your ass, um, which is different than actually working the problem. Um, so I. I think we we have to demand it as consumers. Um, there was a lightning talk about this this morning about what you can do to affect this. It's shareholders, it's employees, it's consumers. That was the SECs, as he put, which I think is important. I do think that um, there is regulation and policy that needs to play a part in this as well. But the reason this topic is so relevant to me is because I think we think about this in terms of big technology quite a bit. Um, I don't. I, I typically am not consulting with the big companies, right? They are doing a lot of that stuff internally. I typically consult with much smaller startups or enterprises who are starting off new sort of side hustles, right? And they need they need help getting their products to market. And what I find is that the ethics conversations in those moments are, are just as important as big technology, even though they don't have the scale of it, right? So this culture of talking about ethics and responsibility and and how we can serve the audiences of our products. Um, in a responsible way needs to happen in all of those moments and can't be relegated as a conversation just for big technology. The thing I will say though, uh, I know you said you wanted to talk about some of the things you've heard. I want to challenge something immediately I heard this morning. Um, let's go there. Um, which was in the uh, digital civility panel. Who was in the digital civility panel? Who was there? Okay, it was a great panel and it was very, very smart women. So I, I'm not challenging the premise of really anything that was said there other than one major thing, which was calling technology a tool. And, and here's why I challenge that. You know, a word processing program is a tool. A word processor and a spreadsheet and a slide maker and your email client and the mechanism for which you access all information on the internet all together owned by one company is not a tool. It's a platform and it's a grid. And it's a grid that it's becoming almost impossible for people to, ta to detach themselves from if they want to function <laughs> as normal human beings. So when big technology is that much a part of our life, right, that we find it difficult to separate ourselves from it in any meaningful way, that is no longer a tool, right? Tools don't learn from us, and the technology is learning from us. It reminds me of, I'm going to age myself here, but it reminds me of Jeff Goldblum saying that the pirates of the Caribbean do not eat the tourists at Disneyland, right? That's what, that's what it's like calling technology a tool at this point. So I just wanted to throw, throw that out there. And he also said, just because you can doesn't mean you should. That's right. <laughs> I can add to that. As somebody who has worked inside of technology companies and somebody who has left that world, I feel what's happening right now is incredibly powerful. I have a blog post that I've written for a while. I haven't published it. I will eventually, it, which is ironic because I used to be a tech blogger when I first got to the Valley. There was a time when a company like eBay was creating so many opportunities. So technology became this, not just a tool, like you said, it's a powerful platform. It was connecting people. It was creating livelihood for a lot, millions, right? Millions of sellers on the platform. So there is there are examples of technologies get, that can change the world and do good. But then we got into this world where um, the, 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 this is the era of activism. Right, because there are people within these companies who are realizing that they are also impacted by the same technologies that they are developing. So there was, used, there was this dissonance, I feel, for the longest time where they feel like the technologies that we are developing are affecting those people out there and they're so disconnected. But now I feel like there's a lot more empathy 
uh, we are seeing walkouts across the board at all the tech companies. And I know, I used to know some of the folks who work there, and, and I still do, and I feel very valid. I feel like, yeah, these are good people. They work for these tech companies, but I would like to make sure that this is not making a case for big tech, but really acknowledging there are human beings and women, especially who work in those organizations, who deserve more of a platform and a voice. Uh, because if we don't support them, who will? Because they have the power and the platform to do good. But when we shut out the women, the minorities who work there along with a company, I think we're doing a disservice. And actually, they could be powerful allies in this as we move forward. I guess I'll take the last stab at this. Um, I know you work with the big companies. <laughs> so <laughs> They're all in. great. And <laughs> I, I, I think that ultimately, it, you know, it does come down to these changes have to happen from within companies. But it's not necessarily going to start there, right? And so I look at that really as a three-legged stool. And so one of those legs is what happens at the organization itself. One of those legs is regulatory. Um, and the third leg is really consumers or those who are subject to the technology or subjects of the technology. And I think that across the board, we require the other two legs to prop the third one up, right? Pick whichever ones you want to use. And so it's incumbent upon us as consumers of technology and subjects to techn of technology to hold those companies accountable for that, to demand things from them that we may not have today. I think that it's incumbent upon regulators to get out in front to kind of set the guardrails for what's okay and what's not okay. And we see you know, that, that companies are really, they're, they're asking for it, they're begging for it at this point. Um, and it's really meaningful at companies to, you know, have, to, to empower people who have the passion to do that. What I see at client, across client, across client, is the person that gets the, the blessing to do the, the, the ethics work at the organization is the person who's been beating the drum about it for years. They're the person who is really an advocate for it, who wants to do something, and then they get anointed like, okay, go. And they're kind of like, oh my goodness, what do I do now? And I think that's really where, you know, I'm hoping to empower those people to be able to make the change that they need to make and to really kind of share knowledge amongst um, each other, right? The, the practitioners in the space across companies. So we started this thing called the Data Ethics Salon Series. I see a couple people who have participated in that in the audience, which is fantastic. Um, this is something that we're now in the process of spinning out. I'm in conversations with a couple nonprofits where this would become a, a program of them because ultimately what we wanna do is publish best practices. And as a professional services organization, should we publish those ourselves, we become liable for having implemented those within our, in our case, 500,000 person workforce around the world, which takes more time than what my publication schedule is kind of a bit more aggressive than that. And so, you know, I think through collaboration and through kind of relying on peers and kind of trying to prop up those other legs of the stool, we can really kind of get there and we can accelerate that, that movement toward a more ethical future. So one question I have for you then, um, Stephen, is how, and this is something that we struggle with too, oftentimes with our, with our clients is, um, it's hard to make the case for integrating ethics within your processes because it cuts into the existing processes. Like we're, you know, we're working with organizations that are moving at like light speed and what it feels like we're asking them to do is slow down or take profit cuts. And so it's hard, really hard to make the case when it's intended to go beyond or be integrated into core products and services. So do you have advice about how to do that? Yeah, so my, my um, entry into this space and into conversations with clients is really one focused on risk. Um, as a traditional business who's been doing business for decades, if not 100 years, um, what they're really concerned about is their ability to continue doing business in that way for you know, another hundred years, really. And so you can address that desire and by the leadership in, that, in those conversations, right? The board of directors, they care about that organization being around in a hundred years. The general counsel's office cares about mitigating legal risk. 
senior executives like want to basically retain their position within the organization, which may only happen if that organization is growing and continuing to thrive. And so the conversation that we start with is one about risk. You have probably undergone, if you're a legacy company, you've probably undergone some sort of a digital transformation. As part of that, you're realizing that, oh my goodness, there's risks that we're taking on that we never had before, we never accounted for before, and we sure as hell didn't manage these risks before. So how do we bring those, how do we bring those to bear? Right? There's a number of conversations I'm having now with, with chief regulatory officers at banks, which their chief risk officers, I'm sorry, they're, they're saying that we know this is part of our portfolio. We don't know where this quite fits in. Can you help us find that match so that we're doing things you know, on the up and up and we're doing things as good as we can, especially because we're looking at AI solutions to start teaming with our people to you know, basically deliver clients results faster, right? And so, some of the things that we've looked at, so consistently across, I, I, there might be a few exceptions, but almost everybody is asking for, I want some kind of governance, right? And one of the things they ask for is, I want essential governance. And to your point of, I want to move fast and break things, right? I want to um, not be an impediment and add friction to what my product and project teams are already doing. I, I just kind of want to add another layer in that they're attending to. And so there's certain things that we can do, right? We can, we can adjust kind of a DevSecOps approach where we can adjust your definition of ready and definition of done for agile. Um, and we can make you kind of think about what some of these risks are that you might want to attend to. And then we can kind of design in, or we can reflect on what we've designed into that solution. Was this sufficient? Did this meet the risk? Are we still exposed? We can do things that triage those risks as they, as they occur. So my philosophy is one that um, it, it's values-based decisions where those risks are entered into systems. And so if we can train people to recognize when they're making values-based decisions, and we can flag those in a very short survey that we've worked with some um, sociologists and psychologists on, of can we get those people to kind of self-opt in to take this two-minute survey that asks questions like, if your mother or children were going to use this technology, would you want to sit next to them and hold their hand? And if the answer to that is yes, then we're going to have to have another conversation, right? If the answer to that is no, then OK, that's fine. There's no risk there. If the answer is maybe, then eh, depending on your other answers, we might still need to have a conversation. Are, um, are those the right ahead. people in the room, though, to be making those kinds of decisions? I know, like, yeah, I got to I got to say <laughs> I'm a little I'm a little suspicious of ethics as a as a process. I feel like no one ever changed the world with compliance. And it's just like not, it's not, so it feels like that's a good thing to support the conversation, but it's, it, that it's happening a little late. And granted, the scale of the clients you're talking about is not the, the kinds of clients that I typically work with, but where the ethics conversations are the richest and the most controversial, frankly, are when a business model is being decided, right? The monetization is when ethics needs to be a part of the conversation. It gets manifested in a design. It's, that's certainly part of the conversation. It gets manifested in engineering. That's part of the conversation. But I, I reject wholly that um, ethics is an output that can be checked off on a, on a box, right? I, I think there's elements of that you can, you can help um, but I think the conversation has to happen like much, much sooner because as soon as you're deciding how this product is going to interact with the users to make money, which is what almost all of them are trying to do, like let's recognize that it's a business, there's a business needs, there's a set of own objectives, that's, that's when the conversation has to be happening. Once you're, you, you are way over here and sort of risk is, you know, mitigating, it, it's too late. Um, you need to be thinking about the intention of, of the business from the very beginning. And I think we're, I, my, per, my personal opinion is we're really struggling with this right now in this sort of West Coast, uh, particularly Silicon Valley mindset about what it means to, to build a business um, is suffering. And you know, the New York Times has done a huge series on, it's called The Privacy Project. I don't know if anybody's read it, but they've done a lot of really good articles. There were two really great articles that were on the New York Times this week. And one of them was about is a mental- Rob Walker's? Uh, yeah. No, well, this was about the mental health product, which okay. there's yeah, actually yeah. a panel right now going on about technology and mental health in another room. And that's sad, because I would go to it if I wasn't at this one, but- Don't promote the other panel. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> People are here. This don't is the leave. right panel, because now we're going to cover so both. No, now you're getting mental health and you're getting ethics, right? 
Perfect. Um, but it, it's a great story about um, mental health being the next frontier for productizing and technology, right? And it tells this story about this entrepreneur who decides to create a mental health app. And his primary experience with mental health was being sad that his first startup failed. I cannot think of anything more emblematic of Silicon Valley than mental health being determined by a 24-year-old entrepreneur who has that limited in experience with mental health. And it's going to track your moods throughout the day. It's going to have you input data throughout the day. And I'm sure there is a monetization right, plan somewhere with what they're going to do with that data. And that vulnerable population of people who need mental health support, we all know that that data is data that could affect their employment chances, that could affect their benefits, right? This is really, really personal data. And as we build products for vulnerable populations, if we are not having a conversation about what that means and thinking about all of the unattended consequences about that early, early on, we are not doing a justice to our audiences and our users. And we're certainly not thinking about ethics in a meaningful enough way to, to make a difference. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to go like clap every time you said that. I totally agree. I work on the other spectrum. I work mainly with mid-size to large enterprises. In a lot of cases, the ships already sailed, right? And you're looking at legacy systems and you're looking at old ways of gathering data and such. Um, so we have introduced a six-dimensional model. And to your point, it's not just one thing. Ethics is, OK, how is data being gathered, right? Are you, do you have consent? Like Facebook, Cambridge Analytica, right? What is the consent you're giving up? Uh, what kind of information are you giving up to these companies? And then we look at, OK, ethically designed systems can still be unethical. You can still use a perfectly ethically designed system to discriminate against people uh, from marginalized groups, right? So the question is, we look at six dimensions of it, and you can look at the website as to what the six dimensions are. But we look at also, what about job displacement? Like, what are the different stakeholders, to your point, who need to come to the table? And that is thinking through, what are the consequences? Um, one thing to keep in mind. I, address, uh, since you went there, I like it, um, I'll address the elephant in the room, is that ethics is not sexy. The reason I choose to focus my effort and time and energies to, <laughs> okay, uh, to actually promote and support more women in the space, because it doesn't make you money. Right? It saves you from risk and bad things and makes you feel like a good human being. Let's face it, like, it doesn't appear on your balance sheet other than as risk. You're saving risk, but it doesn't add, it is going to slow you down. So the first thing I learned, the first piece of advice I got when I got to Silicon Valley was ask for permission later. Right? So now, in my new work, I don't work with as many technology companies. I work with big data, and I work with a lot of cybersecurity companies. But I feel like technology was these bad boys, right, who were just running as fast as they can, breaking things. And then you go to this other world. Um, I'm actually speaking at the Life Sciences Conference in Indiana later this week. And the biggest difference between the two industries, technology and this healthcare, is that they're actually saving lives, so they cannot be they have to be cognizant. They have to think through, like, who is this impacting? So at Oxford last week, there was this interesting notion, and I support it full, wholeheartedly. It's like, what about, what if we applied medical ethics to technology ethics? I mean, just think about it. There is a well-developed body of work in that space that we are thinking through all the consequences. Why should technology companies be immune to consequences? They should be forced to look at the same things. So. That's something I'd really want to explore further if anybody wants to talk about it, but I think that is an interesting notion uh, to really delve into, but really you need to have a more of a, a multi-stakeholder perspective on things, but also thinking through right till the end as to like who are the groups of people who are going to be impacted by what you're doing. Yeah, I think to, to your point on that, which is a good one, so I want to build on it just a, for a minute. One of the people who I gained a lot of knowledge from, it was a mentor early for me in this space, was someone with a PhD in medical ethics, um, did a postdoc in, in kind of data and digital ethics and what does that mean? It was really kind of a pioneer in that space. And so I, th I think there's a lot to be learned. We just published a paper about establishing uh, uh, governance for ethics and AI at large organizations. And we drew from, this was a collaboration I did with the Ethics Institute at Northeastern University. And we drew from a body of work on really from medical ethics, right? From IRBs at universities, which came into to life because of um, very 
um, shall we say, human detrimental experiments at a number of universities over the years. And then um, also looked at things in life sciences and, and, and medical field, right? So there's a lot to be learned from, from those that have kind of the giants that came before us. But to the point about risk always being something on kind of like an operational side, I, I do see that, um, but I think that it also can happen much earlier. And that's really what I'm focused on, is like how do we change that software development life cycle and, and really have that? And your, your question earlier about the people, are the right people in the room? So for instance, we, we published, one of the things we published in 2016 was this whole list of questions that looked at ITIL service delivery model, looked at pro project management institutes, best practices, put them side by side, looked at, oh, at each of these stages, there's some kind of pre or post mortem that we do Today, we generally call those code reviews. Um, how do we inject the right questions in these code reviews? And what turned out to us as we started deploying these things was that you know, it's not a fact of whether these are the right or the wrong questions. The right people aren't actually in the room to lead these discussions with the engineering staff that's there and the, the project management staff that's there to, to really get us to the point of, of those questions. And so we iterated on that, and we came up with this notion of spectrums. Right, and so one spectrum might, and this is modeled off the, the um, Agile manifesto. So one side of that spectrum is a status quo, and the other side of that is an ethically higher bar. And what that means is something like model an aggregate population over an individual. So today the status quo is I wanna market to the person of one. Um, the ethically higher bar is to say no, actually that, that party of one is actually a member of a much larger group that will all receive messaging in the same way. That's actually a harder engineering problem and engineers love hard problems. Mm -hmm. And so it, there's kind of that double benefit there where you can, you can challenge those engineers to say, no, actually, look at this. And the, the point of the spectrums, and, and there's a, a, about a dozen that we start from, but every, every group kind of needs them to be customized. Um, the idea is not that you land over on the ethically higher bar end. The idea is that you land closer to that end than where you started, and you can have these discussions without that expert in the room. Because it really is, you know, if one side is juxtaposed with the other side, movement on one begets movement on the other, right? And, and that's really the kinds of tools that we want to add in. And it's not something that introduces friction. It's something that we can integrate into existing pathways. Can I add one thing? Speaking of tools, is there anyone here from Microsoft? Okay. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> Um, uh, Mira Lane was on one of our panels. Uh, I also run the SFAI meetup groups, and she did this amazing uh, talk um, about how Microsoft's appro uh, approaching AI, and they're also one of our sponsors. We love them. Uh, but uh, they have introduced these cards, and these cards, for someone to say, it's beautiful. If you get a chance to get hold of those, maybe you have some to give away. That'd be fantastic. And these are cards that you actually um, use to have the stakeholder conversation. It forces you to think through who are the stakeholders that you should be talking to, what are the conversations you have. It's really to facilitate. I think we've gone past the whole point of let's talk more about ethics. I, I love when I see companies who are introducing tools and resources to make that actually actionable. I think that's really where we need to go. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's hard to make the assumption that a lot of organizations are past the point of just getting those conversations started. I think there is actually um, a lot of diversity in where organizations are and having these discussions, especially in organizations where it's not actually being driven by the top, but it's more of a grassroots effort um, from within the company. Now, when I was... Um, talking about are the right people in the room, I think one of the things I'm kind of asking about is something that you're focused on, um, Mia, which is representation within the space. And I, I think like oftentimes I work with enough technology companies where I'm the only one who is like me in the space. And so um, I think a lot of potential issues surface um, I was working with a client once who was creating something for a vulnerable population and they were talking about collecting data on this population. Now this is right around the time that um, all of like the fear about DACA recipients was happening and I was kind of like, why do you as a governmental entity need to collect data on this particular vulnerable population? And they were like, well, 
we need it in order to be able to help them. And I was like, I, but that's not enough of an explanation for me. Um, but I didn't feel equipped to be like, you shouldn't, you should collect this, but you shouldn't collect this, you should collect this, and you shouldn't collect this. So I'm just wondering, um, do you have, I know you've dealt with a similar situation, Carrie, do you have tools or ways of kind of having those conversations the right way? Uh, well, I think have them directly, first of all. I'm a, I'm a say the thing kind of person. It's hard as a consultant sometimes, but um, we, had a, we had a similar situation. We had a very vulnerable population that a product was being made for. The good news was that it was a very representational leadership team that was making decisions, and they were mostly uh, people who were also part of that vulnerable population. So there was a lot of empathy, um, but they were still building a business, right? They still needed to monetize, and that's why I think a lot about business models and, and those conversations. It, it was very difficult, and you know, in the end, it was their product to make their decisions, regardless of what we recommended, but we at least forced the conversations. Um, they, they did go on to do some monetization strategies that I, I think were somewhat questionable, and they ended up not working either. So um, that's not always the case. We've, also, we've obviously seen lots of questionable strategies that have worked beautifully. Um, right? uh, so we, uh, you know, there was a little bit luck with that, that it, it didn't work either. Um, but we did, we did force the conversation, and I, I think we have to do that. It's like this idea, um, consent came up in a few of the panels this morning and I thought a lot about like what, what a fallacy consent is, right? This idea that anyone understands it, let alone if they had the time to read it. Let's just pretend we all did have that 76, was it hours or days? Days, that's what I thought, um, that was mentioned this morning that it would take to read all of the, the privacy policies um, that are put in front of us, but let's pretend we did have the time, we wouldn't understand most of them. And they're, they're written to be open-ended enough that when they figure out what they want to do <laughs> with the data right later on, they're still gonna have the loophole to do it, right? Because, because that, that's the one thing we've learned in the last 20 years is we don't know everything we want to do with the data and we have no idea how much money we could make off of it in 10 years. Um, so the policies are, 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 you know, are fairly vague, they're obscure, they're definitely not written with the user in mind. And worse than that, we're incentivized to say yes. Right? And incentivization is one, you get to use the product. Two, the product usually works better because it can personalize the experience to you. There are also products that literally incentivize you giving the data. So this was the other article that was really interesting that came out in the New York Times this week, which is about an app that the University of Alabama has put out for all of its students at their football games because uh, people leave their football games because they're always really, you know, um, boring after Alabama has beat the crap out of whoever they're playing. And so all the students leave and go party and they wanted them to stay. So they put an app in there that tracks their location and rewards them with better bowl tickets if they stay for the whole game. So an entire you know university of students have been taught that their data and, and their location is less important than better bowl tickets. And their university is who is doing it. And in the article that, you know, the person who's directing the program said, like, nobody was even concerned. No one even said, oh, I don't want, I don't think you should have my location, right? Because I'm gonna get better bowl tickets. This is the world we are creating with technology. And the consent idea puts like no advantage for the user, right? Because they still get all of the unintended consequences and then they're culpable because they said yes. I, so there are two things. You started with uh, awareness, right? Cheryl, you mentioned, do we have awareness of uh, why this is important? So one is awareness by the companies who actually have to implement this ethics and be ethical, so that's one, and be responsible for what they're putting out there. But then there's awareness on the consumer side, right? The consumer, the user has to be more aware. Uh, on When we run these meetup groups and we have data scientists coming from small companies, and it is a cost. Like, again, let's just address it head on, but ethics is an additional cost. It slows things down. So one is just showing an incentives or risk structures which actually show companies that they should be doing the right thing. But then on the other side, uh, I think Harini was in the room, she might have left, and she and I were talking about how what we think about what's fair and our notions of privacy are different, right? For some people, uh, how many people here are still on Facebook? Right. I know many who shut down their account because Facebook, evil, 
taking our data, right? So even within this room, we have different expectations of privacy. So when you create something, it's like keeping in mind what trade-offs are your users willing to make? It's not all dystopian because I'll be honest, like I am on Facebook, I never share anything, I don't want out there anyways. On the other hand, I know, um, the people who put their whole lives on there and the children's data, which is not very responsible. So I think a lot of that still has to happen in terms of education. Uh, and there are a lot of people who are working actively in this space. And I think we should raise awareness of the work that they're doing, which I'm trying to do in a small way, is there is a trade-off between your privacy and the convenience you get, right? And understanding that for each user, that's going to be different. And how do we craft policy that's actually meaningful without going overboard and making it so bureaucratic that companies or even, like you said, the 70 pages, like who's going to read it? So making it easy for them to understand. If I give up this information, this is what um, it might be used for and so on. So it's, it's, still, it's complicated. There's a couple aspects to this that I, I kind of want to highlight. So one is, you know, this notion of collecting data. And I, I would say that a couple years ago, maybe four or five years ago, the, the, the standard from our clients was, we have this huge data lake. We've been collecting it for a very long time, ever since data was available. And you can just install Hadoop, turn it up to 11, and wait for the insights to pour out, right? And the answer is... <laughs> No, no, that's not how that works. Um, in fact, our recommendation is that you completely get rid of that entire thing because that's a huge liability for you. And two, you start to ask the questions that you want to answer. What are those strategic questions that your business needs to be differentiated, to grow, to whatever those objectives are that you have? Then we can bring the data scientists in the room and we can figure out what kind of data you have access to that will inform the answers of those questions and that's the data that we're going to keep and that's the data we're going to put into Hadoop, right? We don't want this data lake. In fact, it's probably going to give us misinformation at best. And so, you know, th that's one side of it. The other side of it is a little bit of encouragement. So one, I'm going to plug another paper, um, the, the informed consent and data in motion. Um, at Accenture.com slash data ethics. And so... <laughs> Didn't you want me to put that up on a slide? And I was like, um, you can talk to it. <laughs> that, that's okay. So um, the reason I bring this up, this was one that we published in 2016, but it's very relevant today, especially to this notion of consent, right? Where this started was we were, we were researching one paper on what does it mean to, to have informed consent versus consent, and what does it mean to do no harm? And those were two separate... Those were two separate papers. And what we figured out was like, we can't really talk about harms without the context of consent. And the really interesting place where this lands is when we have data in motion, when we have live streams, right? When you're, when you're watching Twitch and someone violates the, uh, the terms and conditions or terms of use, you know, that is something where you might have done something I have not consented to, right? If my child is watching it and now there's all of a sudden cursing on a channel that's labeled safe for kids, that's not something I want to expose my children to. And so, I didn't have consent for that kind of thing. One of the things that's really encouraging to me is I actually just sent this to a new client um, earlier this week because the client was um, in, let's call it mobility, and they're interested in saying, how do we help consumers realize that there are choices they can make in mobility that are more aligned with what their values are about climate change, about you know, how they might move through the urban core and that kind of thing. This notion that it's not just your truck or car or SUV that is your option. There's bicycles, there's scooters and whatnot. And is there a way, you know, we have this app that our consumers use for all of these new services that we have. We have them go through this process. Is there a way through that consent process that we can not only help to inform them, but we can use that as a mechanism to market these other modes of mobility? And it's like, that's the genius, right? Because if we look at kind of two examples that have kind of blown this whole consent thing out of the water, one is um, Sage Bio Networks, which has you kind of has gamified that consent process a little bit, and they've, you, you learn something by going through it, um, but it is fairly, it, it is fric more frictionless than the Open Genome Project, which requires you to read like two or three full pages and then take like a 20 question test. And if you don't score 100% on the test, you don't get to participate. 
So you can retake the test until you score 100%, but they want to make sure that you're well aware that your genome is going to be in the public sector and or public domain rather, and and at some point in time that might be used to discriminate against you for a job. It might be just used to discriminate against you on a dating site, et cetera, et cetera. Can I add one thing to it? I think the underlying issue I think really need to address is the question of trust. Do we trust the company to do the right thing with all the data they're gathering? You said it could be used. It could be used for surveillance. It could be used to um, deny you health coverage, for example. So really what it comes down to, do we trust the companies to do the right thing with all the data that they're gathering? And when we give consent, we are giving consent in, at a point in time. What is to say they're not going to change that, the TOC, in the future to use it for other purposes? And I think it all comes down to, do we trust the companies to do the right thing? And also, if they break the law, I mean, if they break your trust and they decide to do it for other things other than what you gave consent for, and it could have been informed consent, but how do you hold them accountable? And I think it goes back to your original point about we still need regulation to hold them accountable. So I think it, that leads me to something that I've been thinking about just this week. There was an interesting um, provocation by Rob Walker in the New York Times, and he said, there is no tech backlash. And he used kind of data to um, reflect how the market is reacting to all of the things that we're talking about in the industry. Um, it's that, you know, Facebook has grown by 8% over the last quarter, even though if there's like one company that you could argue <laughs> has a PR ethics problem, it's that. Um, and then kind of talking about data collection, for example, in the news lately, um, Amazon's been under fire for the idea of potentially sharing the information or video from their ring doorbell system with law enforcement. And so, yet, Ring is like the best-selling doorbell that you see on Amazon because people are, the argument is that people see the benefit even though they're kind of unsure about whether they actually trust the company to behave in the right way. Or they simply don't care. And so, I'm wondering if there's kind of a bubble in the industry in which we're actually thinking and talking about these things and is it actually not permeating <laughs> in the public sphere? I mean, based on the conversations I have pretty regularly, it's, it's not permeating. Um, you know, we, I think we have lots of West Coast bubbles for sure, um, but this one I think is, is a, a real one. And when I talk to people who are not in technology, a lot about this privacy project, um, all the articles that the New York Times has been putting out because they've been really good, they're kind of like, why would I want to read that? Why would I, you know, I, I have a 23 and me. They have Alexa. Yeah, yeah, I have a 23 and me kit sitting in my kitchen that I ordered by my own like choice and I'm still too scared to take it because I'm like, no, don't do it. And then I get up and go, today's the day I'm going to use my 23 and me kit. And I talk myself out of it every day and I told a friend that who's not in technology and he was just like, why wouldn't you do it? I did it a year ago, it's so great. You know, all this stuff. And I was just like, uh. you know, like we, we live it, and so I think we, I think that's important because we are the creators uh, and the innovators, and I think this is the reason why I, I don't think we're having the conversation too much. I don't think there's too many all tech or human type conferences. I don't think there's too many panels like this. I don't think we, it's like, it's like diversity, equity, and inclusion. We haven't won that battle yet, so stop like pretending we need to stop talking about it. We, we have to win this, and we, we haven't won. And every person in this room, I think, is interested in technology in some way. And many of you, I assume, work in the industry. If you're a product creator, if you're a product designer, if you're a product builder, you're a consultant, you work for big tech, small tech, medium tech, uh, and for God's sakes, if you're a founder, like you have more power than you think you do. And you should use that power both to affect the business model and the decisions that you're making on a day-to-day -day basis for yourself, for your clients, for your users. But you should talk about it. Um, because this is the other reason I reject that technology is a tool. Technology is our life at this point. There is not much that we do that doesn't involve it. We did not pay our bills through the television, right? We, the television couldn't even collect data on us until it became a digital platform, unless you had a Nielsen box sitting in, in your living room, right? Like, this tool is collecting our data, and we are living our life via 
the interfaces that it provides for us, right? And it, that's becoming so ubiquitous that you can't really choose to not do it that way. Who's going to go back to depositing checks at their bank? Who would do that? I don't think bank, do banks exist anymore. I, I just send stuff. Like, I don't. Um, so, you know, we have to think about it that way. And every small decision that we're making and all the small conversations we're having actually do make a difference if we keep it up. So kind of um, jumping on to that, I, it makes me think about a conversation I had with somebody who works at one of the big five tech companies. And he was saying that he's working on an emerging technology and he was saying they have these conversations about choices they have to make and the things that they want to be thinking about and anticipating. But their legal organization is like, do not put that in writing. <laughs> do not email this to each other. We do not want it to end up in a deposition. And so he, he was saying that it, he felt like it was actually hampering the discussion because they can't just address this in the way that they normally would address everything else about their development process. And so I think, Stephen, we've had this conversation <laughs> where Stephen's like, I don't know how much I can talk about uh, my clients. And, and I just feel like there is something about this conversation that is, um, yeah, it's detrimental for us to not be able to move the actual methods and approach forward because everybody is afraid to talk about it, or at least in big organizations, they're afraid to talk about it. Yeah, I, I think that um, the... There's two aspects to that. One, one being the notion of like, you know, we need to have a lawyer in on all of these conversations so that we can protect this conversation under privilege, which I am not a legal person, nor am I qualified to give legal advice, but I've checked with a number of people who are, and they tell me that's kind of hogwash and would never hold up in court. Um, and so I, I'm kind of left with this opinion where if we look at what has happened in cybersecurity, and those companies who go above and beyond and can demonstrate that they've gone above and beyond compliance are routinely held to a lower um, um, stick standard, I guess, right? That the, the enforcement actions against them are less severe than those who are not even meeting minimum compliance. And so, you know, it brings back another kind of thing that I repeat time and time again, which is leaders don't set or leaders don't follow compliance frameworks, they set them. Right, just as the policy panel was talking earlier, that you know California has this opportunity to really kind of set the the tone for the nation on what privacy will look like within the U.S. You know, the same is true of any company who's leading in this space. So you know, it, it's my job to kind of challenge those notions of the people who say, you know, oh, we need to have a lawyer in on all of these conversations so that it's not discoverable and we can contain it under privilege to say, no, you actually want to do this. As we're setting up you know, review panels and governance within organizations, you need to have your executive team know what's going on in those conversations. They want to know kind of how you're skating on the edge of disaster, right? Because at the end of the day, this is about existential risk. And we can certainly look at a number of companies that have been in the news where we can say, you're engaging in existential risk where your company may not be around in a number of years, and that number might be pretty low. I, can, can I add something to what he just oh, said? Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then if we can take, maybe we can, do we have room for like one or two questions? Oh, okay. okay I'll make it quick. <laughs> so building on what you just said, it's, these are complex problems, right? We are trying to use new technology to solve systemic problems, human problems. So humans are the problem. When we talk about bias, we're talking about ethics, who are we talking about? Us. But it's easy to point at technology, so technology is a problem, but humans are the ones creating the problem. So it will take time, but I feel optimistic. I'm looking at the crowd in this room. I mean, we wouldn't be here if we didn't care about responsible innovation, so that gives me hope. There is great work being done. It needs to be disseminated more, and we need to raise awareness more, and this is not gonna happen overnight. And there'll always be people who are okay. Um, 23 and me. I didn't take it, my child did. I had, um, they're, they're actually an option. You can opt out. You can opt out of having your data in their database, so they cannot sell your data. There are options, it's just a matter of being educated, and come on, we do live in a bubble, it's a technology bubble, and there's so much we can't figure out. There's so many experts who are still trying to figure this out, but it's a start, but 
it's not going to happen overnight, but it's going to happen. But we're at least talking about it, and I think that's a good start by itself. And their consent process is fairly robust, we all add that. Yeah. I feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> is there... <laughs> Tonight I spit. Who wants to be the lucky question asker? Go ahead. Um, I'm wondering if from a technological perspective, is there any technology you know of where you could kind of tag data that's collected on you and be in control of it? Kind of on, like on a phone, I can periodically check what am I sharing? So what if there were some file of what the internet knows about me? That, that is a brilliant idea. I want to plug a project that doesn't exist yet, but I have a handful of patents on, which is a trusted data exchange to give just that agency to data disclosers and research community and so forth. Um, but that's something that I've been trying to get off the ground for about three years now. Um, and we're starting to implement pieces of it, but it'll take a while to really kind of get it to where it wants to be. There's actually a site which also gives you information if your data was breached, if your data was compromised in a site breach. And that's also useful information if you're wondering with uh, everything that's in the news, if so many sites are getting hacked, if your personal data was compromised. So it, 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 it is out there, it does exist, but in a small form. I'm excited about it. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Well, thank you. One that question in the back. Do you want to yell loudly? Yeah, oh, they're good. It is call time. Uh, do you want to ask him, is it for Steven? <laughs> Right. That's a good. A, a very short answer. That's our homework assignment. I feel like transparency is often used as obfuscation, right? Like with, with consumers demanding transparency and then companies saying, oh, well, we're going to disclose all of this data because we're totally transparent. But as you dig into the data, you realize that nothing there is useful at all. Right. Exactly, but I think that there's a lot masquerading as that today. Actually, the word transparency infers that it's not completely clear. <laughs> Just so you know. Well, thank you. That was great, you guys.